Uh, welcome everyone to this webinar. Thanks for being here. Um, as Maria Isabel mentioned, my name is Rosa Maria Roman. I am working for the Center of International Forestry Research, C4, and I am doing research uh, within the SWAM project um, in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, I would like to first acknowledge and thank our donors. We are going to frame this webinar, which is uh, focusing on discussing technical issues around self-standing blue climate emission reporting and mitigation targets under the Paris Agreement and BERA. And I would like to start thanking um, our donors, the USAID, which is the main donor for the SWAM program. Um, which, as you see in this slide, is the Sustainable Wetland Adaptation and Mitigation Program. This program is um, worldwide. We are doing research worldwide and uh, has a C4 and U.S. Forest Service, uh, service, mainly around 20 people working within it, on wetland ecosystems, from adaptation to mitigation to ecosystem services to policy support. Um, as you can see, uh, the SWAM program um, has been running for the last 10 years and it started in 2008 working in Asia mainly, in the Sundarbans, in Bangladesh, but also in Indonesia with all the issues around peatlands. Uh, and then it's been moving uh, towards other continents. Uh, we are also working uh, now in Eastern Africa, Western Africa. Uh, and in my case, I'm working in Central America, the Caribbean, on the role of mangroves uh, in um, sheltering the coastlines against hurricanes. So the, the role of mangroves as green infrastructure for risk reduction policies and their resilience to extreme events. So our gratitude um, to the uh, USAID for this one uh, program. Here you can see the places that um, around 25 30 researchers are working within this initiative. Um, the goal is to, to run research that promotes um, science that then it is useful for policy development. And on the first slide, you could see the website of the SWAM program. We encourage you to take a look because there are a lot of publications. There is on the library, as you can see here, uh, there, is, um, there is a copy of all the publications that have been uh, um, submitted to peer review journals and also to other type of outreach documents uh, within the SWAM project. So we encourage you to, to take a look to that. Also, there is a part of the SWAM initiative is uh, geoposition data sets and maps of wetlands around the tropics, both uh, peatlands and, and mangroves. Um, and other type of digital information. So you're most welcome to take a look and to uh, use whatever could be supportive for your own interests. So also I'd like to say thank you to the um, director of INTE, Instituto de Ciencias de la Naturaleza, Territorio y Energías Renovables de la Universidad Pontificia Católica del Perú, Dr. Eric Cosio, for having helped C4 co-organize this um, SWAM initiative on self-standing uh, blue carbon reporting uh, emissions and mitigation targets and the Paris Agreement and BERA. Thanks, our gratitude to all those technical support uh, that has been uh, helping us to, to run this webinar. Um, and I'd like to frame a bit this webinar and inform you that this is going to be a two-day or a two-session webinar. Today is the first session and we're going to have um, originally three sessions. It's going probably to be, going, yeah, to be reduced to two because one of our speakers is having unfortunately some um, COVID problems in Mexico and will not be able to join us. Um, so today we will have the UNFCCC, the head of the LULUCF sector, um, Peter um, Iversen, and then we will also have the lead um, program officer on blue carbon on the voluntary carbon market bearer to tell us and navigate us a bit on, on potential options for um, organizing, developing, planning and implementing blue carbon uh, self-standing 
uh, programs. And the origin of this webinar was this uh, workshop, this regional workshop with 11 governments in Central America and, and South America on the topic of blue carbons and how to incorporate the mitigation of blue carbon within NDCs. Um, and I'd like to give a bit of context so that you understand better why some parts of this webinar are focused the way that they are focused. So basically the webinar, the, this, the workshop last year um, derived from a very interesting research that was run by the team of Martin et al. Uh, on how countries have been incorporating blue carbon in their NDCs. And one of the things that uh, is rather clear is that most countries uh, in Latin America, but also in other continents, are working on blue carbons uh, and incorporating them in NDCs, mainly for adaptation purposes. And we saw in the case of Latin America and the Caribbean that from the 20 countries that have reported blue carbon specifically in their NDCs, all of them had incorporated topics of adaptation, the role of mangroves as um, coastal uh, support against uh, sea level rise, storm surges, um, extreme events, it's very clearly acknowledged in these NDCs, but their role as mitigation is not so much incorporated. As you can see from 20 countries, only seven incorporated the potential role of blue carbon within mitigation. And um, we, we started running this workshop last year also to understand what were the barriers and the opportunities uh, to make um, a contribution of mangroves in particular uh, towards mitigation within the NDCs. And we will be showing the next slides which were some of these barriers that we will try to focus uh, in, this, in this webinar. Also for us, uh, for C4 and for the SWAN project, uh, program, sorry, it is important to work on this topic because it is a timing um, opportunity right now with the resubmission of the NDCs in 2020 to support countries to incorporate their mitigation targets within their NDCs for, for blue carbon. Also looking in the future to the NDCs global stake talking, um, stock taking, sorry, um, how they can, if they are not able to incorporate it now in the resubmission, then what could be the next steps when, when they have better data and they are more uh, ready to incorporate them in 2023. Also, um, we are leveraging on the Initiativa, Initiativa 2020, which is part of the Bond Challenge, and uh, we are in the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration, so it is a good time also to incorporate a restoration action on uh, blue carbon ecosystems, particularly mangrove, as part of also these mitigation targets within the, the NDCs. Um, from the workshop last year, it was rather clear that some of the current barriers that countries have and the governments have when thinking of creating blue carbon programs have to do with some of the technicalities of the reporting under the UNFCCC um, and also both in their greenhouse gas national inventories in their AFOLU or LULU CF sectors, but also within the Red Plus mechanism. And I'm going to highlight a few questions that have been posed by the governments in the country that uh, we're going to uh, answer or try to answer today in this webinar so that we can support this process. So basically one of the main topics that uh, countries are struggling with is their mangroves are already part of the Red Plus targets and they are part of their FRELs or their FLRs, so if they are net emissions, and then creating blue carbon initiatives uh, when they've already been included into the Red Plus FRELs, uh, it's, it's confusing. There is not a very uh, clear way of uh, extracting the mangroves out of those commitments and then creating these self-standing initiatives. It's also not clear whether they have to extract them out and create self-standing initiatives. So this is something that our colleagues from the UNFCCC will be discussing today. So the first topic is this complication of, of uh, Red Plus. Um, also another complication that we uh, ran into last year in the workshop was um, which type of IPCC guideline, these countries that want to, to report on, on blue carbon and particularly on mangroves uh, should be following for their greenhouse gas inventories of, of, of mangroves emissions. So there was this discussion 
uh, should we work with the IPCC guidelines AFOLU 2016 as it is recommended for red plus or in the case of mangroves they should be into the wetland supplement and therefore should have a different type of guideline we will be discussing this today another classical barrier is that many countries don't have data on emission factors uh, based on fluxes so what they have is one time uh, stock measurement of um, different conditions of mangroves. So, or if we are lucky, they do have a representative stock value of different conditions of mangroves, like from conserved to degraded, to uh, regenerating, to locked mangroves. So the question is how we move from one value of a stock into something that is translated into the the changes of, of carbon that are needed as emission factors to report uh, uh, the greenhouse uh, emissions associated to this forest type. We will be dealing with that. Another classical question is the soil carbon component of this blue carbon. Most countries in the region that are doing their efforts to report mangroves in their greenhouse gas communications, in their national communications, and in their greenhouse gas inventories, they only have above ground biomass um, data or changes in, in carbon in the above ground uh, but as we all know soil is one of the most important pools for uh, mangroves and therefore to have a complete reporting we would need to incorporate dynamics of the carbon uh, in the soils at least for, for the mangroves uh, so what can be done towards that direction and then another classical question that countries in the region themselves were posing and they, they, they were kind of stopping and hacking their progress is what would be the difference between working on blue carbon within the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement uh, and working on a voluntary market uh, at a project or a jurisdictional level that uh, for some countries it's, it seems more feasible to start in, in a lower scale to work with their blue carbon uh, initiative. So these are a few of the topics that we'll be discussing today. And I'd like to um, also start with some considerations. Um, first would be the definition of blue carbon. I would say Blue carbon right now starts to appear in different contexts with different definitions, uh, but I think, and, and it's not officially defined within UNFCCC. Uh, there are some mentionings of it in the uh, special report on ocean and cryosphere. But uh, in this webinar, and I think that for most of us, for most of the governments that are participating into this uh, webinar, and, and a warm welcome to you all. Uh, blue carbon incorporates three ecosystems. It incorporates mangroves, it incorporates coastal wetlands, and it incorporates seagrasses. In this webinar, we're only going to focus on mangroves. Um, and this is just because most of the countries that are participating into this webinar, and that they are the reason for this webinar today, uh, to support these Latin American countries uh, and their governments, uh, half most of the data that they have is on mangroves. Um, some countries like Mexico do have seagrass data, uh, but let's start with mangroves, which is the one that uh, most countries are more advanced and more familiar with. So even though blue carbon is a more general ecosystemic concept, we're going to focus on mangrove in this uh, session. Uh, the second um, consideration is that uh, we're all fully aware that mangroves offer um, a diversity of ecosystem services and as I was mentioning before I myself and we are working on the role of mangrove green infrastructure to protect uh, coastal uh, communities against extreme events hurricanes in the Caribbean and the Mesoamerican shores so mangroves also have a role in, in terms of supporting biodiversity in terms of uh, as I said, sea level rise, uh, fight against sea level rise by accretion um, sedimentation processes. Um, food security as well, since they are also responsible for sheltering certain early stages of some fish, some commercial fish that then uh, move out of the mangroves towards um, the ocean. So we are fully aware that uh, there is more than mitigation um, services provided than mangroves but in this webinar we are going to focus only on the role of uh, mangroves as mitigating sequestrating carbon uh, as part of the fight against climate change. 
and therefore very focusing towards mitigation targets and towards and disease mitigation. And this is include both adaptation and mitigation, but this webinar is only mitigation. Also, you will see that some of the questions that we'll be focusing today um, are real questions from real governments in the regions, and that's why we are targeting these questions. It's not that there are not many other questions that could be asked, but these are some of the questions that we are trying to answer um, to some of these uh, governments that are joining us today. Uh, we will open a section of extra questions after these presentations, after each of these talks, so there will be space for extra questions uh, when yours are not included there. Also, and as, as a final warning, and, and our gratitude to the speakers that I will be now introducing, um, please let's make sure that uh, we understand the discussion of this webinar as a non-prescriptive approach. Uh, the speakers will share their experiences, they will navigate with potential options, but there are many options possible. Countries and governments are free to choose whatever options and methodologies they prefer. They are more ready, they are more aligned with the national circumstances. So by no means whatever is said in this webinar responds to a prescriptive methodological approach against or uh, in favor of, of, of one or other. It's just certain panorama of different options that countries could use to enlighten their next steps. So uh, without further ado, we're going to have uh, three presentations. Um, Peter is right now in a meeting, so we're going to start with Amy, but I'm going to introduce Peter first. So uh, Peter Iversen is the team leader of the land use, land use change and forestry at the United Nations Framework Convention and Climate Change Secretariat in Bonn. Um, Peter has a lot of experience in, in the LULUCF and the Red Plus negotiations. He has been more than 20 years working on the nexus between nature and resource management and working for organizations like FAO, UNDP, and, and currently he's uh, working under the UNFCCC. He's also been a long-term uh, consultant for um, under the several UN organizations, development banks, NGOs, and private sector. He was the co-chair of uh, the UNFCCC negotiations for Red Plus and also accounting of agriculture and LULUCF under the Kyoto Protocol. And also he's been involved in as co-chair of agricultural discussions under the SAPSCA. Um, he has some um, hands-on experience on the Red Plus mechanism. He was supporting the Cambodia government with the red in his face. And then he's currently supervising uh, the Danish government, he's himself a, a Danish national, on the reporting of the land use uh, emissions and removals of greenhouse gas um, inventories under the UNFCCC. And he's an expert reviewer for IPCC good practice guidelines and conducts technical analysis of red plus results and participates in numerous workshops um, as the one today. So our gratitude for Peter and, and UNF Triple C colleagues for being here today. Then let me introduce Amy. Amy will be our first speaker. Um, and Amy Schmidt, she's the head of the Blue Carbon Program at Vera. Uh, she's the Program Development Manager and she coordinates all the Program Development Initiatives for Vera's Voluntary Carbon Market Programs, including VCS, Voluntary Carbon Standards, the CCB, and SD VISTA programs. In this capacity, she identifies, develops, and implements uh, the improvements of program requirements and processes. And she also explores opportunities for the scaling up of bio sequestration activities, especially focusing on blue carbon. So, also, Amy will be introducing the topic of blue carbon within the uh, voluntary carbon market, and then we'll open a space for her to, um, to be asked questions uh, that countries uh, could have. Also, uh, unfortunately, he's not able to, to make it. As I mentioned, uh, there are some bad news today for, for this person because they are having some COVID uh, health issues that have prevented him to participate. But Jorge Herrera is a dear colleague of us, of C4. He's been collaborating with us in Latin America long term very well-known researcher on mangrove restoration dynamics, extreme experience uh, and hands-on experience, extremely useful on um, 
both developing mangrove restoration activities, very focused on hydrological restoration rather than on reforestation of mangroves, which um, now within C4, we are publishing these guidelines on, on uh, lessons learned of mangrove restoration action. Um, he is a researcher within the Simbestat Merida uh, Yucatan unit, and he is a responsible for the mangrove monitoring program in the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, some of you might know him, um, and in the next uh, email, uh, these emails of these speakers will be shared so that uh, in case you need to communicate with them. Without further ado, I'd like to open the floor for Amy Schmidt from the uh, Vera so that she can start her presentation. Thank you so much, Amy. Amy, you're, yeah, perfect. Hi, um, yes, thank you so much uh, for giving me the opportunity to um, speak with all of you about blue carbon um, with Vera and blue carbon in the voluntary market in general. Um, as Rosa mentioned, I am the program development manager here at Vera and I lead our blue carbon work um, within our nature-based innovations work that we are doing. Um, so before I get started, I wanted to give a brief introduction to Vera for those of you who may not be familiar with us. Um, we are a nonprofit organization that started off as the Verified Carbon Standard a number of years ago um, and have more recently expanded our work into other standards and frameworks that deal with climate change uh, issues and sustainable development. And so now we manage a number of different um, standards uh, for project and landscape level certifications. Um, today, during this presentation, I will primarily be focusing on our VCS program, the Verified Carbon Standard, um, since that is the program that's used um, for certifying voluntary uh, climate claims. Um, specifically in my presentation, I'll be walking through an overview of the voluntary carbon market um, for those of you who may not be as familiar with it. Um, and then I'll go into some of the specifics of the VCS program, including how it can be used, um, blue carbon methodologies and uh, kind of greenhouse gas methodologies in general, the project development process and what that entails, um, also, some information about monitoring, reporting, and verification requirements under the VCS program. Um, providing a couple of project examples for blue carbon projects, and also about how VCS projects can link with other programs to certify their non-carbon benefits. Um, I'll also walk through some of the opportunities and challenges that we see for um, voluntary blue carbon project development, and I'll get into a little bit of um, UNFCCC versus voluntary accounting and how they can um, work together and also some of the differences that um, there may be between uh, those two different types of accounting. Um, so quickly to give an overview of voluntary carbon markets, um, this is a graph that was produced by the Ecosystem Marketplace, um, which is a function of forest trends um, that provides information about um, all of the credits, uh, carbon credits issued in the, voluntary car in the voluntary market as a whole. And so from this graph, um, you'll see that uh, the VCS standard is by far um, the largest voluntary standard and most widely used standard. Um, so in the graph, uh, both the bars that are represented by the dark blue color and the turquoise color um, are credits issued from VCS projects. So um, this is information from uh, 2019. And so um, this is kind of the general trend that we see that VCS is very widely used in the voluntary carbon market. Um, we've also seen an increasing importance of natural climate solutions, um, both within the VCS program and with uh, VCUs issued, but also in the voluntary market as a whole. And so 
in in this graph, uh, it, it shows um, VCU issuances over time with um, issuances from AFLU projects, uh, agriculture, forestry, and other land use, including any blue carbon um, in the green color, and uh, VCU issuances from all other project types in the um, kind of medium blue color. And so, especially starting in 2017, we've seen a switch to where um, most of the uh, carbon credit issuances from uh, the VCS program are from AFLU projects. And actually, these issuances are really driving an increase in the total issuance volume. Um, and so that suggests that, first of all, there's an increased demand for voluntary carbon credits in general, but also that there's really an increased demand in these natural climate solutions. Um, and just to be very specific about this, for natural climate solutions, we mean um, both conservation projects, including uh, reduced emissions from deforestation and degradation, or RED, and also restoration and removals, including reforestation, um, agriculture and soil carbon, um, grassland restoration and conservation, and blue carbon. Um, and blue carbon can be pretty unique in this respect because uh, even conservation projects, um, which result in emission reductions, also result in um, carbon sequestration in the soils. Um, and so another trend that we're starting to see is that a lot of demand is uh, coming from sources that are very interested in these emission removals, so projects that um, sequester carbon um, in natural ecosystems rather than only um, reducing emissions. So getting more into the detail of what is a voluntary greenhouse gas program. So for the VCS program, um, we have most of our rules and requirements are governed by the VCS standard document. Um, and there are also accounting methodologies which are used for projects to um, know how to monitor and measure their emission reductions or removals. There's independent auditing, which is very important to ensure that projects are developed and implemented and monitored in accordance with the rules of the methodology and the rules of the standard. And we also have a transparent registry system where all of our projects are available um, for anyone to view and where all credits issued from projects are transparently listed with uh, any serial numbers or associated information. So um, within kind of this construct, I'll go into a bit more detail about the VCS standard. So as I mentioned, this is the document that includes guiding principles and high level requirements for all VCS projects. And so within this document, there's information about the activities and interventions that are eligible under the VCS program. And in many cases, there are specific requirements um, and safeguards for specific activities. So for example, um, blue carbon fits within a category that we call wetland restoration and conservation. And within the VCS standard, there are a number of specific requirements that all wetland conservation and restoration projects must follow. Um, and these are intended to ensure that projects are accounting correctly um, for their emission reductions and removals, um, and they're doing so accurately. And also that they're not causing any other type of, or causing any type of harm to the environment or um, kind of downstream effects from a project activity that aren't taken into account. The VCS standard also provides information about project length requirements and the time frame over which projects can be credited. So for all uh, AFLU projects, including blue carbon, projects must have activities conducted for a minimum time period of 30 years. And they can credit over a time period of 20 years to a 100 year maximum. Um, there are also certain legal considerations uh, that are set out for projects to take into account. And so this mostly includes ownership. So for any project, the entity that claims ownership of the project must be able to demonstrate that 
they have control over the project activities and the rights to claim the emission reductions or removals that they are claiming under the VCF program. Um, and so in certain cases where, um, for example, communities may have traditional rights to the land um, or where there are uh, government rights to the land, um, that would mean that um, you would just need to work with any of those uh, other entities to ensure that there's clear ownership of the project. We also require all projects to comply with any local laws and regulations that are relevant to the activity, um, of course. Um, the VCS standard sets out certain social and environmental safeguards. Um, so this includes uh, community engagement where it's relevant um, to ensure that uh, any communities involved within the project or that could have their um, kind of traditional lands affected by the project activities are aware and have an opportunity to provide uh, consent for the project to occur. And there are also environmental safeguards to ensure that the project is not causing any type of environmental harm. Um, of course, we all want, you know, blue carbon projects to do environmental good. So it's important to address these to make sure that no negative effects are occurring. Finally, um, one risk for any carbon project uh, that's based on land or on wetlands is the risk of non-permanence of the emission reductions or removals that the project has claimed. Um, and so this could be from a loss event. Um, so kind of in a traditional terrestrial forest context, you can think of that as being a fire occurring that results in carbon stock loss um, from the project area. And so under the VCS program, we address that through a pooled buffer account. So all AFALU projects are required to assess their risk of non-permanence using a standard tool and contribute a certain percentage of their credits to the non-permanence uh, non risk buffer. Um, and in any case for uh, a lost event within the project area, the full amount of the buffer credits are available to cover that loss event. So this ensures that any credits issued under the VCS program represent permanent emission reductions or removals. So methodologies are very important components of a project. Um, they set out a lot of the key ways that um, projects demonstrate that they're eligible to be a voluntary carbon project and also ways that projects um, must monitor and calculate their emission reductions and approvals and removals. Um, so the first component of a methodology is the applicability conditions. And so these are sets of conditions that define the activities to which the methodology applies. Um, and they're important because um, Obviously, methodologies are very specific to a certain set of activities, and in certain cases, they're also um, potentially applicable only to a set of activities in a certain geography. Um, and so it's making sure that it limits the projects that can apply it to ones that actually should be applying it and are doing those activities in areas um, where it makes sense for the way that the rest of the methodology is set out. Um, the methodology also sets out the project boundary requirements. And so this is not necessarily the spatial boundary of the project. So the actual land area that's included within the project. Um, within a greenhouse gas program, the project boundary refers to the carbon stocks and pools that are included and also the greenhouse gas emissions um, that can be claimed by the project. Um, so for example, the project boundary may include above and below ground biomass, soil carbon, um, avoided CO2 emissions from avoided deforestation, um, and avoided uh, greenhouse gas emissions from biomass burning, for example, depending on the activity. Um, a methodology will also set out how projects are required to demonstrate what the baseline scenario is um, and then quantify the emissions that would have occurred in the baseline scenario. And so the baseline scenario is what would have happened in the absence of the project activity. So for a, a mangrove project that is uh, a conservation project, 
you may be able to say that the baseline scenario would be that the mangroves would be degraded or deforested. And so with project activities, then you would be able to say that they are not degraded or deforested. Um, but within the baseline scenario, you would have to go through a procedure to demonstrate um, you know, exactly how much of the project area is expected to be degraded or deforested over the project lifetime, and then also go through the process to quantify what emissions would have occurred from that degradation and deforestation. Um, additionality is a key component of any voluntary greenhouse gas project. Um, it is essentially saying that, or it's a demonstration that the project would not have occurred in the absence of carbon finance. So basically that the carbon market is providing an incentive for this project to occur in addition to what would have occurred under the without project scenario. Um, so in general, for many of our absolute projects, they're required to use what we call a project method, which involves kind of an investment analysis and a common practice analysis to demonstrate that the project is not um, kind of financially attractive to do uh, or that it's not common within the region for this type of activity to occur without um, carbon or other types of finance. For many blue carbon projects, um, within our methodologies that are approved under VERA, we have what we call standardized methods. And these set out a list of conditions that if they're met by the project, they're deemed as being automatically additional. Um, and that's, we, we have those in place because um, there simply are not many blue carbon projects out there. They've been, um, you know, they faced a number of challenges, which I'll get into a little bit later. Um, but in most cases, it is very clear that these projects need carbon finance, and we've been able to demonstrate per our rules that they can fall into this class of kind of automatically additional projects. Finally, the methodology will set out um, procedures for quantification of emission reductions and removals based on the activities that are included within the methodology and the carbon stocks and pools and greenhouse gases included within the project boundary. And they'll also establish monitoring procedures for the specific parameters um, and types of information that need to be monitored by the project in order for them to be able to claim um, emission reductions and actually kind of input, those, inf input that information into the quantification procedures. So we have a number of methodologies that are currently available for blue carbon projects globally um, with the VCS program. Um, so we have a methodology for tidal wetlands and seagrass restoration that was approved under the VCS program. We also uh, have a revision to a red plus methodology that will incorporate um, blue carbon conservation and restoration activities. Um, and that revision should be coming soon. It's in the final stages of the approval process. So I'm hoping soon means within the next week or two. Um, and so this will be the first methodology in a major greenhouse gas program that will support blue carbon conservation activities. So um, we see it as being very important to unlocking carbon finance for those types of activities. Um, CDM methodologies can also be used under the VCS program, and so there are a couple of um, afforestation and reforestation of mangroves methodologies that were uh, originally approved under the CDM, both for large scale and small scale, um, but as I mentioned, those can be used by VCS projects. So what is the uh, process to develop a VCS project? Um, so as I mentioned, the methodology that a project chooses is very important because it establishes some of these very key components of a project, um, including the activities that are eligible and how the project goes about actually quantifying the emission reductions and removal. Um, so once an appropriate methodology is selected, um, you would draft a project description. And so this includes setting out um, certain elements of the project design, 
um, most of which are included within the methodology and are one of the key components that I walked through a couple of slides ago. Um, but there is also an uh, opportunity to describe other things about the project and kind of give a bit more of a summary of the activities included. Um, once the project description is drafted, it can undergo validation. And so this is the process um, where an independent third party auditor will assess the project description against the methodology that's applied and also against our program rules to ensure that it was designed in accordance with both the methodology and our rules and requirements. Um, after validation, a project can register um, and then can go move forward with monitoring the project results. So again, per the methodology that uh, that will set out the specific um, carbon stocks and greenhouse gases that need to be monitored. And so once that's monitored, um, the project can also go through a process called verification where a third party auditor will um, verify that the project has been implemented um, in accordance with the methodology our rule and our rules and also that the emission reductions and removals that are being claimed have actually occurred and were calculated correctly. And finally, after verification, a project can issue uh, verified carbon units or BCUs. Um, one note is that um, validation and the first verification can actually be conducted at the same time, um, which can result in a cost savings, uh, generally because um, the auditor will only need to go on site once rather than going on site for the validation and then coming back for the verification. Um, but they can also be conducted separately if that works better. In terms of cost of this process, the main costs for um, voluntary greenhouse gas certification are associated with the validation and verification process. Um, so as I mentioned, these are both conducted by independent third party auditors. Um, and so a project generally will need to obviously pay them for their time to do the validation or verification. Um, but for AFLU projects, they almost always are required to go on site um, to conduct a site visit for both validation and verification. Um, obviously, right now, with a number of travel restrictions in place um, due to the global pandemic, we are being um, a bit more flexible with our rules around this and allowing for remote verifications to occur where possible. Um, so it's, it may be that in the future, those will be more commonplace, um, but kind of historically, it's always involved a team going to the project site. Um, in terms of some specific MRV requirements for VCS, so for um, kind of conducting a verification, the timing on that can be flexible. So projects are not required to conduct annual verifications or verifications within any certain time period. Um, so you can include multiple years of monitored data per verification um, if that works out better. Um, or if you want to conduct a verification more frequently, for example, on an annual basis, that is also allowed. Um, so as I mentioned, um, in terms of monitored data, that will be in accordance with the requirements of the applied methodology. Um, and that will be used with the um, equations and uh, calculations within the methodology to calculate the carbon stock changes uh, and or emission reductions and removals that can be claimed. Um, for verification, there's a requirement that that's conducted by an approved independent third party auditor. And then finally, VERA will also review and approve um, any monitoring reports that are submitted by projects as a kind of a final check to make sure that they are, in fact, um, applying the rules correctly. Um, so for blue carbon projects, in general, and again, this is really methodology specific, so it's a bit difficult to say for all of them, but in general, they'll include um, kind of parameters and methods for monitoring above and below ground uh, biomass and carbon stock changes, soil carbon stock. They may include emissions from fossil fuel use and biomass burning, if those are expected de to decrease in the project scenario. Um, the VCS approved methodologies also include um, what's called an allochthonous carbon estimation. And so allochthonous carbon is 
um, carbon that is sequestered outside of the ecosystem um, and then generally is kind of transported to the project area through sediment. Um, and for a variety of reasons, projects are required to estimate that um, both in the baseline scenario and the project scenario to ensure that they're only claiming the emission reductions or carbon stock changes that occurred directly as a result of the project activities. Um, they'll also include for conservation projects, um, any area of kind of expected or uh, I guess area of expected wetland degradation compared to area where wetland, de de the wetland degradation actually occurred. Um, and then of course, um, projects are required to estimate their non-permanence risk, including the risk from sea level rise. So we have a couple of blue carbon projects that are either under development or registered under the program. So the first blue carbon project um, in Latin America that has listed on our registry um, is being developed as a conservation project in Colombia. Um, and this will include a variety of conservation activities to conserve a large area of mangroves. And that project is under development. Um, and we have a few other mangrove restoration projects that are registered um, and have been through kind of the validation and verification process um, that are located in Africa and Asia. And um, more information about all of these projects is available on the VERA registry, where you'll be able to see all of the project documents, um, including the project descriptions and monitoring reports and validation and verification reports about these projects and how they were designed. Um, so one thing I wanted to touch quickly on is uh, additional certifications. Um, so these are additional standards that can be used to certify environmental and social safeguards or additional benefits. Um, and both of these that I'll talk through very quickly allow for a label to be added to VCUs issued from projects that are verified to both standards. So. Um, a VCU with a CCB label or a VCU with an ST Vista label, um, which indicates to any buyers of credits that uh, the project is one that's not only resulting in these climate uh, benefits, but also have these other um, environmental or social benefits associated. So the climate community and biodiversity standards um, has been around for a number of years and was developed by a number of um, environmental and social nonprofits and is now managed by VERA. Um, and it allows projects to certify benefits to uh, climate, local communities, and the environment. And projects have to have benefits to all three of those components. The Sustainable Development Verified Impact Standard is a bit newer um, was, and was released at the beginning of 2019. And it allows projects to certify their contributions to the sustainable development goals. So it has a very strong link with the SDGs. Um, the SD Vista standard is also unique because it allows projects to issue um, assets that aren't carbon credits. And so actually one of the first uh, assets and methodologies that's being developed under that program is for coastal resilience. Um, and that's being led by the Nature Conservancy. So this is kind of a really important highlight of um, not only the climate benefits of blue carbon projects, but also these other benefits. And what we've heard is that there is additionally kind of significant demand for these coastal resilience benefits and that using kind of both of these programs together may unlock significant finance for blue carbon activities. Um, so as you saw from the kind of blue carbon project slide, we don't have many blue carbon projects that are registered under the VCS program yet. Um, and this is an area of kind of action that we think is very important, um, not only because of the significant climate benefits that it has, but also because of many of those non-carbon benefits that are associated with um, blue carbon ecosystems. And so earlier this year, we started a blue carbon working group um, to explore a lot of the opportunities and challenges associated with blue carbon projects, and also to identify um, solutions to those challenges or ways that we could help support um, scaling up of blue carbon activities. 
And so what we've heard, this is kind of a very brief overview or summary of what we've heard so far from the working group, but there is a really high demand for blue carbon credits and especially for kind of credits that represent carbon sequestration or removals. Um, so there aren't many blue carbon projects out there right now. And what we've heard is that uh, the demand for blue carbon credits actually, you know, significantly um, outweighs the current supply of blue carbon credits. There's also a lot of opportunity around the associated non-carbon benefits, including coastal resilience, as I mentioned. Um, some of the barriers to blue carbon projects include that um, the methodology that includes conservation activities is not yet approved. There's also a lot of technical complexity um, that is associated with wetlands and wet, wetland methodologies. So including um, hydrological connectivity with other ecosystems that needs to be taken into account. Um, the estimation of alloxanous carbon, as I mentioned, and then also planning for um, sea level rise and being able to estimate that over long time periods and planning for how wetland migration may occur inland um, over those long time frames. And finally, data availability um, can be very, very difficult, um, especially for projects that are starting in regions where it's not available and they may need to go out and collect a significant amount of data at the project site. Um, so quickly before I end my presentation, I wanted to talk a little bit about some differences between um, UNF C accounting and uh, accounting under the VCS program. So first of all, there's kind of country versus site level accounting. Um, so, you know, for the UNF C, if you're reporting, reporting at the country level um, or for subnational regions, um, the type of data that you need versus what you would need for site level accounting is different um, just because of the scale that you are looking at. Um, there's also differences in the types of ecosystems and activities that are generally included in the UNFCCC versus those that could be done under VCS. Um, so for most NDCs and forest reference emission levels, um, they focus on uh, kind of conservation or avoided deforestation and mangroves. Um, whereas under the VCS program, we currently support conservate or we will support conservation, hopefully very soon. Um, but we support restoration of mangrove seagrasses and salt marshes. So we do allow for kind of all of the blue carbon ecosystems right now. There are also some differences in the carbon stocks that are generally included and um, the greenhouse gas emission sources included in accounting. Um, so depending on what's kind of included in a, in a forest reference emissions level, um, a lot of times that may only include above ground biomass, whereas under VCS you can do above ground biomass and soil carbon and um, just kind of get a lot more specific in the carbon stocks that are included um, within the project. So finally, um, there are some areas where um, there could be uh, kind of working together between project and national level or subnational level accounting. Um, so where mangroves are included within um, the definition of a forest or within the forest reference mission level, blue carbon projects may be able to nest into the frel. And so essentially what that means is that they can align their accounting with that national or subnational accounting of the forest reference emission level. Um, so some caveats to this, however, are that frills may not always include all blue carbon ecosystems. So, um, you know, right now, if you're doing a project with seagrasses, for example, you are probably not going to be able to nest. Um, whereas if you're doing a mangrove project, it's more likely depending on the specific country context. Um, they may also not always include all of the relevant carbon stocks, pools, and greenhouse gases. Um, so for example, the soil carbon pool is not as frequently included, even though that's a very important pool for blue carbon projects um, and can be claimed under the VCS program. And finally, um, a lot of frills do not include kind of carbon removals or carbon stock enhancements, um, which are included under um, certain BCS project types include that include restoration. 
So there's a potential for double counting of emission reductions and removals if a project is claiming something under a voluntary program and so claiming like an emission reduction under a voluntary program and that same emission reduction is being claimed by a country. And so being able to nest helps to align the accounting so that there's less risk of double counting. Um, and another way that we're kind of considering addressing this, which is less relevant for the AFLU sector, um, but could be relevant for blue carbon projects that are not able to nest or aren't able to nest kind of in the short term, is that double counting may not be um, as much of an issue between a voluntary project and a country for purely voluntary carbon claims. Um, so for example, carbon credits that are purchased by um, sources that are doing so for their corporate social responsibility. So in that case, they're kind of reported and claimed under um, completely different mechanisms. And so there may not be a risk of double counting. Um, however, um, we're seeing in a lot of compliance programs, including Corsia, that there really will be a requirement for mm -hmm. AFLU projects to be nested into a jurisdictional program um, to have kind of assurance that there is no risk of any type of double counting or claiming occurring. Um, but that is kind of an ongoing conversation um, within our organization and other uh, voluntary greenhouse gas programs um, and users and of of uh, GHG programs and kind of people in that space. Um, so it's evolving a little bit, um, but that's kind of our current thinking. Um, so I will end my presentation there. Um, thank you all for the opportunity to speak with you and provide more information about blue carbon under the VCS program. Thank you very much, Amy, um, for this very informative um, session on blue carbon and the um, BEREP. Uh, that was a long chat, so thanks a lot. <laughs> so let me open the space now for questions. Um, please use your chat uh, to make questions. Try to be very short and specific on your questions. We're gonna open 15 minutes for questions to Amy. Um, so I'm gonna take a few seconds to start working on merging questions that are uh, similar. But I ask you to ask very specific questions. Um, Okay, let's start with the question by uh, Diego Hopkins. Um, Amy, he would like to know if, uh, if there is any way for indigenous communities to implement a carbon project on themselves without intermediaries, and if there is the possibility of direct contact between community and verifier. And in the case of state-owned lands, can the government present an initiative to implement a carbon project and generate benefits to distribute among, for example, indigenous communities? So let me start with the first question. Um, is there a way for indigenous communities to implement a carbon project on themselves without intermediaries? This is rather important for Peru. This question comes from Peru that has a, a very important participation from forest stewardship coming from indigenous communities. Thank you. Yes, so indigenous communities or local communities are able to develop projects themselves um, as long as they can, you know, meet the ownership requirements that I walked through earlier. Um, in practice, uh, oftentimes it can be very kind of technically, you need a high technical capacity to develop a project, um, in which case we see a lot of um, project developers working with local communities, but that's definitely not a requirement to do so. Perfect. His second question, Amy, was, um, is there a possibility of direct contact between communities and verifiers? Yes. Um, so if a community is leading a project, they would um, be expected to kind of interact directly with the verifier. And also um, for our uh, kind of social safeguards that we have under VCS, um, even where communities aren't leading the project, they're required to be involved. Um, and generally as part of a verifier going out and auditing um, that involvement, they will have opportunities for direct interaction with communities as part of the assessment process. Thank you, Amy. And Diego's last question has to do also with the redistribution of the benefits coming from these projects. He says, in the case of state-owned lands, can the government present an initiative to implement a carbon project 
and generate benefits that then get distributed among indigenous communities that are far away from the area of the project? Um, so yes, um, under the VCS program, we don't have specific requirements for benefit sharing. Um, so, you know, that would be kind of outside of the project um, description or project documentation. Um, so the government would be able to do that. And uh, just for any communities that are directly involved in the project, they would need to be able to give their kind of consent to any project activities, including any benefit sharing mechanisms that are established, um, even though we don't have specific requirements for what those are. Thank you, Amy. Then there are two questions about time. Um, do you know, or can you tell us when the uh, BCS standard in Blue Carbon Red Plus will be available? Yes, um, so the methodology revision is in the final stages of approval. So I'm hoping that that will be available within the next couple of weeks. Um, we'll have an announcement on the VERA website. Um, and if you're on the stakeholders list, you'll also, or you should also get um, an announcement that way. Um, but we're hoping within the next couple of weeks that that will be officially approved and available for use. Thank you. Yes, we will be sharing this presentation and some of your links appear uh, without the link. We just see that you have connected it. So we will make sure that some of these links are also shared so some people know exactly where to get this information. Um, also, we have a question from Elisa Lopez. She's mentioning us. She's asking you whether uh, you could explain a bit more about the statutes for the conservation methodology. Um, and then he says, understand the barriers of Vera BCS in the spacing on the topic. So, uh, Elisa, please elaborate the second question, but let's start with the first one. So, can you develop a bit more of the statutes of the conservation methodology? And I think when she says the statutes, maybe you can describe a bit what conservation probably means in relationship to maybe a restoration. Thank you. Yeah, um, so the conservation methodology is based around kind of um, an existing red plus methodology. So for conservation projects, um, they are required to, you know, do activities that will reduce wetland uh, deforestation or degradation and account for that by estimating where kind of what's causing that um, wetland degradation, where that's occurring and how the project is actually reducing that. And so um, in practice, what that may mean for addressing the drivers of deforestation is working with local communities um, to find alternative livelihoods so they are not, um, you know, cutting down mangroves for a firewood or something like that, or um, working with them to establish sustainable fisheries, which are very linked with blue carbon ecosystems. Um, restoration activities would involve more going out and um, restoring degraded wetlands, so planting mangroves or helping to reestablish mangrove nurseries or ecosystems there that are not already exist in, in existence. Um, thank you, Amy. We have a question from the government of Suriname. Um, if you could kind of explain a bit, and this would also be part of the discussion with the UNFCCC, uh, Peter will be discussing about this, but she's asking if you could kindly uh, go through the double counting uh, section of your last slide, please. Sure. Um, so double counting is where, um, for example, the government and a voluntary project are claiming um, the same emission reduction or removal. So it's being claimed or counted twice. Um, and so for a blue carbon project, there are kind of two ways that we're thinking that this would be addressed. So the first is through nesting. Um, so aligning the project accounting with kind of a national or subnational um, baseline for deforestation and forest degradation, um, especially for mangroves. In which case there's, um, you know, it's, it's aligned with like a government baseline. So there's not a risk of kind of double counting between the government and the project. And then in terms of, and this is more important for activities that aren't able to nest within a national baseline. So um, in the context of blue carbon, that may be restoration where that's not included, or it may include these other ecosystems that generally aren't included in a national baseline or frel like seagrasses and salt marshes. Um, but we're seeing a lot of the market um, 
kind of agree or begin to agree that there's a difference between a purely voluntary claim um, for a project or site level activity versus a government's claim or reporting of what's happened within the country or subnational region as a whole. Um, and so what we're seeing is that for voluntary claims, um, there may not be kind of this strict requirement that all voluntary projects have um, nesting within the national baseline um, for activities that are included in them or what's called a corresponding adjustment where the government adjusts their emission reductions and removals that they're claiming happened within the country. Um, basically to say that, you know, something that happened in the project area didn't actually happen within the country, um, which isn't as accurate since it did happen there, but the project is just claiming that the activities that they conducted are what was what resulted in those emission reductions. And so that's what we're seeing in the voluntary market. Um, the only caveat is that for certain stricter um, uh, adjustment made to national accounting for any um, credits that are used in that compliance market. Um, and so that would be things like Corsia. Um, Thank you, Amy. Uh, three last questions. One comes about um, the, the price of blue carbon credits. Um, uh, there is a question of what is the estimated price for a tone of blue carbon and whether this is different to normal or other type of, of uh, carbon uh, reduction units. And let me ask you on the top of that, uh, what is the cost or medium cost of a blue carbon project? So if someone would like to start thinking of applying for this type of methodologies, what would be the cost? And the third question in this line of action, you are mentioning that there is much more demand than supply for blue carbon. But one of the problems that we are having in the region is that even though we do have already decided areas where to do restorations, for instance, in the case of Mexico, there is already like a strategy of which areas could be restored. Uh, it is hard to connect with the donors. So is it, how could we connect with these uh, corporate responsibility initiatives that could pay in advance some of these projects? Do you maybe have some suggestions on these things? Thank you. Sure. Um, so in terms of the cost for project development and the price for credits, um, we aren't always, or we aren't ever directly involved in selling credits. Um, that's between the project proponent and a buyer. Um, but what we've heard is that for certain blue carbon projects, they're seeing um, very high prices compared to other VCUs. Um, I've heard, you know, project developers are kind of conservatively estimating $10 or $15 per ton, um, which is significantly higher than what we see even for other types of absolute credits. In terms of cost, again, as I mentioned, we don't, I guess Vera isn't involved in kind of the highest cost um, components of the project, which are validation and verification. Um, from what we've heard for uh, other AFLU project types, um, for example, RED, um, the cost can vary just depending on kind of project location, complexity, the auditor that you choose, and how far they have to travel to the project site. Um, but for a project, um, it could be between $20,000 US to, um, you know, 40000 or more US. Um, and then in terms of connecting kind of projects with donors and funding, this is also um, a, a barrier that has been raised in the context of the Vera Blue Carbon Working Group. Um, and so we're, we're thinking through ways that that could be addressed. Um, as I mentioned, kind of in the past, Vera hasn't really played this role where we're really connecting projects with funding or with buyers of credits. Um, but we're seeing this kind of huge disconnect between the demand for blue carbon credits and actually being able to get funding to early stage projects. Um, so I don't have much information on what that could look like now, um, but we do see it as being very important to figure out ways to connect this finance and this early stage funding with projects. Perfect. Um, there are quite a lot of other questions. Uh, some of the governments in the region um, also wanted to know a bit more of, um, information about how blue carbon projects can be nested with the trails. Um, and then we will finish with one more methodological question on um, using jurisdictional um, 
uh, uh, what is the question? Jurisdictional standards for blue carbon and some of the difference between the three um, methodologies that you mentioned. Thanks very much, Amy. Thanks a lot. Yep. Um, so in terms of nesting blue carbon projects with frills, right now it's really limited to countries that include mangroves within their frills. And so in that case, mangrove projects would be mangrove conservation projects would be able to nest um, per kind of the, the process that any other project would take um, to nest within a frill. Um, VERA is releasing um, guidance and requirements on nesting that's more specific than what we have available now, um, likely early next year. Um, we're currently working on developing that and thinking through a lot of the technical issues. Um, and that will provide more information about kind of allocation approaches of how um, a FREL is actually allocated down to kind of the project level and things like that and specific requirements that need to be included. Um, but if you have kind of more specific questions about that, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm not as involved in um, kind of the jurisdictional and nesting world, but I would be able to connect you with my colleagues who are um, and we can have a joined up discussion about kind of blue carbon and nesting. Thank you. Um, the, the other questions were a bit more methodologic and also we'll finish with one question from Panama. Um, the, there was a question about whether uh, we could use the jurisdic jurisdictional standards for blue carbon. And also there was someone asking what are the, real, the, the differences between M, uh, VM007, V1.5 and V1.7. And then there are some also questions about the V07. Uh, so yeah, maybe you can explain very briefly <laughs> This, this yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so right now, I'm I'm assuming that you're talking about the jurisdictional nested red program under Vera. And so I apologize if you're not, and I'm answering specific to that program. Um, right now, WRC wetland restoration and conservation is not included um, very kind of in a lot of detail within the JNR program. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there, we're releasing kind of this additional nesting guidance and requirements, and we're also making certain updates to JNR. Um, and one of those updates that may or may not be ready by January, but it's potentially in a longer time frame, um, is adding specific requirements for how to include WRC activities within a JNR program. Um, so it's it's something that's not um, very well defined right now, but we are definitely thinking about it, and we know it's important. Thank you. Thanks very much, Amy. So a bit briefly, the difference between the um, M7, 1.5 and 1.6. And the last question comes from the government of Panama, which I think is actually very important for, for those countries that have indigenous communities and in coastal areas about land tenure. So which type of safeguards do you have for land tenure and for, for avoiding um, uh, complications around that? Thanks very much. Yep. Um, so the differences between uh, VM7 version 1.5 and version 1.6 are that version 1.6 will include um, uh, specific modules and procedures for tidal wetland uh, projects, including conservation and restoration activities. Um, version 1.5 does not include those. It includes activities on peatlands, um, but it's not specific to the tidal wetland context. Um, and so there are a number of VM7 is a modular met methodology, so it includes a lot of different documents. So um, the one version 1.6 revision includes new modules specific to tidal wetlands and also some revisions to the existing modules to incorporate tidal wetlands where it's relevant. Um, and for land tenure with local communities, um, that's really addressed with our social safeguards for all AFLU projects. Um, and so specifically for any communities that may have um, any type of right to the land, including um, either kind of traditional rights um, or traditional use of the land, um, project proponents and you know, entities conducting project activities are required to get what's called free prior and informed consent from all of those communities um, for implementing activities on the land. Um, so if communities do have land tenure, they must um, basically have all the information that they need and be able to have the opportunity to provide or not provide consent to the project activities before they start to occur. Um, so it's a very important safeguard that we have within the standard. 
Thanks so much, Amy. Um, thank you, everyone, governments of the region. Um, we will put you in touch with Amy um, and find a way that she's not overwhelmed with hundreds of questions either. So maybe if, if necessary, we can try to arrange a second webinar more specific on, on the region and questions from this government so that we can address that. And thank you so much for, for this long uh, presentation and very informative discussion of the, the barium blue carbon. Thanks very much, Amy. So um, thank you very much, Amy, for, for this fantastic presentation, uh, very useful. We will actually um, offer information about your email and, and find a way that uh, you don't get overwhelmed with, with email. So maybe organizing a second webinar if necessary. Uh, Peter, is now your turn. Peter Iverson, thanks very much for being here. Um, let us know if you have any difficulty in sharing your screen or if you would prefer me to share the screen and then you let me know when I should go to the next one. Okay, perfect. Wonderful, thank you. Welcome, Peter. Uh, good uh, morning or afternoon. Um, I hope you can hear me and you can see the screen. Um, so uh, this presentation, or oh, now uh, I'm very sorry, I was not here in the beginning of the uh, webinar because of some other uh, commitment. And uh, But this, just to explain that this presentation came based on a number of questions that uh, we discussed in a call with Rosa uh, a while ago. And actually these slides uh, are sort of um, reflecting these questions. So I'm trying to respond to those. Um, so I hope, I hope that will make sense. So uh, yeah, I, uh, maybe just to present myself, I'm team lead in the uh, uh, AFOLO unit in what we call the Transparency Division in the Climate Change Secretariat in Bonn. So our work is, of course, we work with EFLU, which means uh, a very large proportion of our work is about uh, Red Plus to uh, support the technical assessment of Red Plus reference levels, and later also the technical analysis of Red Plus results. In addition to that, we also support sort of LULUCEF, uh, greenhouse gas inventory, reporting and review and we support also we have uh, we are supporting now the uh, Cornelia joint work on agricultural uh, program where we have a series of work workshops uh, happening so this is yeah where i'm coming from uh, so what we of course mangroves are also included something in uh, sometimes in red plus submissions and uh, one of the questions here is uh, are mangroves forest i mean Really, it's up to countries how they will how they define what is a forest. Uh, uh, I think many countries maybe are looking to like what was done, for example, under the Marrakesh uh, uh, Accords. Marrakesh Accords was agreed for the Kyoto Protocol, or it's not really relevant here. But of course, uh, I think most definitions of forest, which actually countries have to define forest when they make a submission, is about like what is the height of the of the trees at maturity? What are the um, uh, minimum area? What are the minimum uh, ground cover? For example, these are three typical uh, uh, thresholds. Where and this also means, of course, if you plant a new forest, it doesn't meet the threshold right away. But still, we have this. If it has the ability uh, potential to reach the threshold at maturity, then uh, it is a forest from the very beginning, anyway. Uh, we actually had one country that also included the diameter of the tree as part of the definition. So there are different options. Uh, in the decision that uh, uh, is um, sort of providing the guidance on how to make a red plus reference level, there is an annex and in there it is it basically says that parties have to uh, define a forest and if this definition if this is different from what how they do it when they have defined forest for the national greenhouse gas inventory and for other international uh, reporting uh, uh, reportings then they should uh, provide some explanation why they have this difference but it is possible to have a difference what we have seen uh, i remember in particular for example bangladesh they have a very large mangrove area and um, and they made a, a kind of exception because they said they really want to include this mangroves in part of the red. So I think the minimum tree height was five meters and they said that would barely make it, but still they would want to call this um, a forest. And that is fine. They just have to be clear about what they're doing 
so it's possible to make a technical assessment of, of what they have uh, submitted. Uh, I think we had another one recently with uh, Suriname also. Um, so, so, so this is this is clearly possible uh, to include your mangroves uh, as as fast if this is what you want. And I, but I guess that it's also possible in some cases if uh, it does not fit to the definitions, then of course it's not part of it. What we also see um, is that uh, a number of countries are saying that, uh, I mean, some countries are saying that plantations, they don't consider this in the context of red, even though they are forced. Some are saying that they don't consider, uh, you could say what they call agriculture plantation, which maybe like uh, palm oil and this is not part of the forest, while maybe uh, forest uh, plantations like acacia, like where you are producing timber, they want to consider as forest. So there's a number of possibilities. It's just uh, a matter of uh, being clear about it and of course being able to monitor. If you make it too complicated for yourself and are not able to monitor and report, then, uh, yeah, then you probably want a different definition. Uh, for the um, reporting guidelines, um, Basically, uh, you can use there's for Red Plus. You use you should use the most recent one. The most recent one that has been agreed is the IPCC 2006 guidelines for national greenhouse gas inventory, uh, which is sort of covering uh, the forest land. But of course, we also have uh, the uh, IPCC 2013 wetland supplement, which is a supplement. So it sort of builds it adds to the 2006 guidelines. Uh, the supplements cover areas that have been re-readed or drained and uh, and in fact this could also it does not only is not only relevant for what you call wetlands but it's also relevant for forest or even agriculture land that is on something you would call uh, that has been drained or re-readed then you could still use the wetland supplement it is uh, so that the for the wetland supplement th there is a sort of encouragement to use it but it's not a mandatory thing. So really what countries should do, they should see if they have, you could say, a better methodology in the wetland supplement and then uh, use that. If, uh, if they don't find a better methodology, then the, you might as well stay with the 2006 guidelines. The refinement from 2019, so this uh, has not been, um, been shared, uh, sorry, this has not been uh, approved by the uh, UNFCCC yet. It has actually not even really been discussed yet. Uh, uh, so it is sort of uh, in the middle in a way uh, before uh, approval, it's approved by the IPCC. Uh, what we see already in greenhouse gas inventories that parties are actually, and even also actually we see for red plus uh, fuel submissions, parties are already starting to use it. Um, uh, the refinement include more tables and, and much more sort of uh, well updated values for many um, default uh, values for carbon stocks in different forest types, including in the tropics and so on. And, and if this is what you need, then you are most welcome to look at the refinement, even if it's not approved by, by the UNFCCC yet. So um, I think this hopefully define, let me see if I can move forward. And see. Oh, yes, I can, sorry. Um, so these are the, uh, I think I don't need to speak more to this. This is basically just the different um, uh, IPCC guidance. Uh, but, oh. Peter, can I jump in with a quick question before we move on? Because I think Yes, please do. please do. Thank you so much. Let's, um, I am aiming to do this uh, interactive uh, mainly for myself, and then we will open the, this, the space for governments to ask you questions. But just we move out of this definition of mangroves, which you very clearly explain that countries can define and then they can adjust definitions depending on, on, on their conditions. Um, regarding the use of the wetland supplement of the AFOLU um, 2000, IPCC 2006, can countries merge both types of guidance when reporting? under the greenhouse gas inventory or under red, or they have to choose one or the other? Thank you. I, I think the, I mean, the, refi oh, not the refinement, the, the wetland supplement is only a supplement. So uh, you would not find everything in there. So I think you would always have to also build on what's in the 2006 uh, guidelines. Um, of course, I mean, they are, as the title say, about uh, areas that has been uh, somehow wet, either re-wetted or drained. 
and um, and you might have other forest areas that are on dry land that has uh, where this is not relevant of course then you would not find any methodologies in the supplement so in this case i yeah you would need to uh, to mix the mix the tools there was some discussion about whether you need to use the the um, um, default values together with the, the equations. If you use an equation from the IPCC uh, wetland supplement, uh, but there has no, not been any decision on that. So I think if parties can sort of say that this is what makes more sense to us, this is what reflects our situation better, then I think uh, it should be possible to use both. Wonderful, thank you, Peter. Okay, let me see if I can do this slowly because I don't, okay. But this is also actually what I told you already, I think, um, that the refinement is there, it's not adopted, but you're welcome to use it. The wetland supplements encourage, uh, and yeah, and you can use it for any, not only for what is what your category is, wetlands, anything that isn't rain and wet. So, so we can move to the next. Okay, so here's the questions about how to measure. Uh, so of course mangroves are like uh, other forests. Well, in, in principle, the principle is the same as other forests that you have the five carbon pools above ground, below ground, biomass. Mm -hmm. You can have some uh, litter, you can have dead wood, and you can have soil carbon. Uh, when what we see is that there's maybe not necessarily as much data on uh, mangroves as we have for other forest types, um, uh, and we. Um, we have actually, maybe I should already go to the next because I think I, I described it there. So the IPCC, when they, when for estimating uh, the, the change in, in carbon stocks, they have two methods, the gain and loss method, which basically is, um, is you could say, what are the, the functions that, that uh, where you have a loss and the function where you have a gain, and then you basically just add the two. Uh, and then you have the other one, which is called stock difference method, which basically you have the stocks at two different times. One of the issues I think mentioned in the other slide here before was, uh, of course, if you have a national forest inventory, then you very often would go to monitor the same uh, area. And then you could say you have definitely the same area in two different times. But this is not necessary always. If you can sort of describe this is the forest, uh, uh, you could say, more or less uh, undisturbed, and here is a forest that is disturbed, uh, and you can clearly define the, the difference between the two, and you know the disturbed forest have 50% uh, less carbon than the undisturbed, then you don't necessarily need to, I mean, you need some data, of course, to show that it's 50%, but you don't necessarily need to have exactly the same uh, spot uh, where you have monitored. Um, yeah, we, we also see different approaches in here because now, I, uh, for example, Suriname, they had uh, from forest degradation. So it was not really based on measuring uh, the same spot two different times, but it was linked uh, to the logging that takes place in the forest. So they had some, uh, based on some scientific studies, they, they basically looked at, you know, when we take a tree out, uh, it creates some destruction and they had a, a an equation for how much destruction uh, would sort of be created per uh, cubic meter. I forgot whether it was in tons of, of biomass, but, but basically linked to the amount of logging. There was some destruction, and then based on the logging, they sort of uh, assessed the, um, the, the degradation. Uh, so in this case, you need some data, of course, to sort of show that this uh, equation you have here makes sense, and they well, we're lucky also that there is a good scientific article on that, and then they just have some national data to put in. So there are different ways to do this, uh, and in all cases you will need some national data. But but I think there's different, often different ways to uh, uh, to get to the results if necessary. Okay, then yeah. So without soil uh, data, so um, yeah, this is a of course. Again, you need some data. The, the guidelines probably provide some uh, default values that you can do. Uh, what is also important that for Red Plus, uh, the results are measured in tons of CO2 uh, per, per year. 
and and this is sort of you always have to compare what is happening in the uh, what we would call the result period compared to the reference level and uh, and if you have very high carbon stocks but they are not changing then your problem in terms of getting results i mean you have the high carbon stocks but they are staying high and that's good of course but you don't have this change that would uh, uh, you could say will give a result so I don't know how uh, the dynamics in in, the, in the soil carbon in mangroves, but of course, if it if it's very stable, then it is not uh, necessarily creating a lot of results. But of course, if it's not stable, whether it's increasing or it's decreasing, if you have destruction of mangroves and now you want to restore, then of course that would be something. Uh, I I believe it's the same when you go to the to the other gases. What we have seen in red plus is when countries report uh, non CO two gases. Basically, if I, I don't know Indonesia because they had drainage of peatlands, but I think for most countries, it is only related to forest fires. And, and here again, you have some equations, uh, how much biomass is burned and so on, and, and you will get some uh, estimates. Uh, from the re-rating and drainage, again, I would consult the, the wetland supplement, but yeah, but I cannot get closer than that without seeing more uh, what, what is there available. Red plus and frill. Um, so here, I think this was actually the, one of the key issues for, for this webinar is that um, how to do it if, if you uh, want to have frill also for different force types. So overall, the decisions from Cancun request parties to make a national frill or, or, or FRIL or FRIL. Or, or if appropriate as an interim measure, a sub-national frill in accordance with national circumstances. Um, what we have seen now, we have received uh, submissions for 50 countries actually. This year we, had, we have 15, which is the, the most we had so far. So we had 15 uh, different countries that made a submission and I believe uh, around eight or nine of them have a um, sub-national frill uh, and the rest have a, a national one. Uh, in case where they make a sub-national, I mean, there could be different reasons for that. I, I, I mean, yeah, I, I think from country to country, there could be different reasons to that. Um, and what happens in the um, technical assessment, of course, in the report, uh, I mean, in, in the submission, the country will explain why it's sub-national and, and maybe they will also explain how this is a step towards uh, national. I mean, one very important point also when countries make the reference level submission, is that it is also recognized in this decision uh, um, about making the reference levels decision 12 CP 17 that this is a stepwise approach uh, and countries sort of can improve over time, include more activities, include more pools, but of course also move to the national from the sub-national. There's also a, a safeguards on avoiding displacement of missions. You could say if you have national, then this uh, is more well depending on which activities you have but but then this is uh, also better covered of course what we have seen Im, just for yes. a clarification is just because many many of us when we uh work with the concept of national uh reporting we thought national scale but somehow uh, at least in my case i never thought that national meant not only national scale but incorporating all the forest types so can you confirm that the idea of a uh, subnational as interim would also re apply not only to working at a, a different scale other than national, so probably regional, but also working with not all the first types, but just with one first type. So I think it's important to clarify that national means both geographically national, but also incorporating all first types. Is, is that correct? Because yeah, yeah. I mean, national is sort of the geographic national, uh, but then of course, based on the force definition, uh, if you have a force definition that uh, say, okay, uh, our uh, plantations, for example, because that's a common thing, plantations we don't consider forest in this context then um, I yeah then may, this would still be national even if you don't I mean because you have everything that that is within your forest definition you have in your frill and what is not within your forest definition uh, it is fine that it's not in, inside your frill because it is not considered forest in this context 
I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, I mean, the question has to do with choosing one forest type, and in this case, mangroves only, out of the totality of, of forests in order to create the, the blue carbon self-standing. And, and I think basically you've already answered. It's, uh, it's uh, the way to move forward would be to have all the forest types uh, included in, in, in one way, yeah. but also countries can choose to go for the interim subnational approach and selecting one forest type only, in this case, mangroves. Uh, the same way that, for instance, Brazil may be reporting on Amazon rainforests separated from Cerrado. Uh, so there are some other countries that are also working with very specific forest types and very specific red Yeah, density. yeah. Right. I think Brazil is not the best example because, I mean, their subnational is so extremely large. I mean, they have one for the uh, Amazon biome and one from the Cerrado, and, uh, and both of these areas are like, bigger than many countries. Uh, and I think actually inside the, I could imagine, with, uh, because I know, for example, how they do it, they have like a carbon map for the uh, Amazon biome. And, and so different areas of the Amazon have different carbon content per hectare. And I think this somehow also reflects that there are different forest types inside the Amazon. Maybe we would all call it tropical rainforest, but then I'm sure if you are uh, more into botany or different things you maybe have uh, would call it different things because some is a little more dry than others or some is on on mountains and some is not and and some is are flooded part of the year and others are not flooded so even with that i would assume they have different forest types inside that huge area i think for the others uh, i mean actually maybe we, will, we will get to some examples maybe it's easier like that so uh, also, in the decision, it says that countries should include the most relevant activities, which are the activities where you have the higher emissions, they should be included. And, and what, you have, what we see is that um, most, I think all submission except one, uh, include, uh, in, uh, maybe that's an exaggeration, but it's close to that, uh, includes uh, emissions, reducing emissions from deforestation. Then we have also seen more and more with including emission, reducing emissions from forest degradation. And we have seen more uh, including enhancement of forest carbon stocks, and then uh, slightly less with the sustainable management of forest and with the conservation of forest carbon stocks. Um, one reason why countries are excluding particular activities is at least in the beginning was, of course, because it was not maybe the most relevant, uh, but it was also sometimes basically they said we don't have the data. So now we, we introduce the one we can and then the others will come later. And I think this is very much in, in line with the stepwise approach what countries are, can, can do. Uh, what we've seen, uh, Chile is also an interesting example because they made um, four different uh, reference levels or they call two of them FRL and then two FRL inside the same submission. We have uh, a number of countries, like I, here I put the example of Vietnam, that, that separate, they have uh, FRL for the emissions, and then they have an FRL for the removals. So they sort of separate emissions and removals. Whether you actually, and that's another point, whether you call it FR, FRL or FRL, has, this has not really been defined in any decisions. And we don't see 100% consistency between how countries are doing it. But it doesn't really, that's not so important. Uh, importance is, of course, that what they do in the submission for the FREL is also what they do when they uh, submit results later in a technical annex. That the country maintains uh, consistency for themselves and with their own submission, this is what, what is important. Not that there's a global definition of this. Um, so, uh, so we, in, in particular in Asia, actually, we have quite a number of countries that made this, uh, uh, like Vietnam, where they have one for uh, reducing emissions, and then they have one for enhancing carbon removals, basically. Um, and in both cases, Chile and Vietnam and all these others, uh, but not in the case of Brazil, uh, but uh, they do it in a, in a single submission. Brazil made separate submissions, one for the Amazon and one for Cerrado. And that also meant later when they submitted results, because they have submitted results both from the Amazon and the Cerrado, they also make it in two different technical annexes. 
and it also means that the secretariat we will uh, do a technical of well, we will not the LULUSAF experts uh, will do a technical assessment of of each of these submissions while in case of Chile and Vietnam here yeah, it's the same two technical uh, LULUSAF experts that will do the technical assessment of all these files because it's in one submission Um, so, um, countries uh, are free in, uh, to submit, actually there's no sort of uh, um, limit to uh, submission and we see number of countries have, I mean, frills, um, here you have uh, Chile, Brazil, Vietnam, but we, we, there's, there's not really any uh, limitation to that. Um, I think the more you, a country friends are submitting, they might create some, I mean, might be more complicated. In the end, you need to be able to report uh, based on how, what you have chosen, based on the activities, based on the force types and everything. And, and of course, uh, in terms of being rational, it very often, maybe if you have a national force inventory, you don't have a national force inventory, maybe just for one force type, if you have it exactly national, for all your forest and, and in this, that could be a number of reasons why it, you can make it a little bit complicated for yourself. I don't know what is the experience with Chile because it was a, a quite also interesting case where they had these different uh, areas of the country and different uh, uh, frills and FRIL and FRLs for different areas for different activities. Other countries generally did not do like that. They more or less did for the whole country and then they just more split depending on here we have, you could say, afforestation, which was often what they would consider the enhancement of forest carbon stocks, and here we have the degradation and deforestation, which would then maybe be the remaining forest. Uh, this about whether the aggregated, yeah, so I said uh, you can, um, what we see, uh, many countries aggregate, but, but not all, so this, uh, again, important in the decision is that the, your country should uh, um, do the most important pools and activities and uh, and again this if a country sort of saying okay we will not include the uh, soil carbon uh, then they will normally include some rationale in the submission saying we don't consider soil carbon is changing that much under our conditions but there's also some cases where they will say basically we have no data and as part of the stepwise approach, we, this is really, we will, uh, we have some ideas to how this can be improved, but this will happen only at a later stage. Um, but of course, this is something in the technical assessment report, the, the experts will note whether this, and they will also say that this uh, seems very, uh, this, they, they can understand that, um, or they can say that this is, an, they identify an area for future improvement. This is what is uh, happening in many reports. Um, yeah, so the self-standing uh, Red Plus or integrating in, in, uh, for blue carbon to be part of Red Plus or self-standing. I mean, first of all, um, now we have this Warsaw framework for Red Plus. It took, I would say, more than 10 years to negotiate and, um, and, and, and now it is working. And um, if you if sort of think about a, a separate framework for blue carbon, then uh, it does not exist right now. Of course, parties can always propose things to the COP, a new agenda item, but uh, it could also take some time. And, and of course, other parties have to agree that this will be an agenda item and so on. So it's not so easy, I would say. Uh, it, it would be easier and faster if uh, whatever you do in the mangroves would also be part of what you do, sort of the you red plus. At least that's, that's my view. Um, and, um, and here we say one monitor system. Yeah, this because also of cost reasons, of course. Uh, again, we have also the uh, in the decisions about how to make a frill uh, 12 CP17, uh, where countries or parties should submit information on the rationale of what uh, of their frill, including details and national circumstances, and, and if adjusts adjustments. I think this is what is also meant here. So some parties, the, 
This is in particular the case uh, where we have uh, high force, low deforestation countries where you could say the preference level they have, they have actually been uh, conserving the forest really well and they have uh, a reference level sort of based on historic data only that it gives very small uh, levels of emissions and therefore it is a bit difficult for them actually to improve very much or, and and there was an opening for doing this kind of uh, adjustment um, again here with one thing i should mention i'll mention that later i mean the uh, the um, decisions taken under the unf triple c is about the uh, the plus the reference level, the technical assessment of reference level, the, the secretariat, I mean, the UFCCC are not providing any result-based payments. I mean, the idea, of course, is you have results and then we also have decisions actually mentioning result-based payments, but then we are calling for financing entities or parting a calling for financing entities. And one of them is the Green Climate Fund. And if you have been involved in their work, you would already know that they introduced like a scorecard, uh, and here they built very much on the UNFCCC decision, but they also added some extra things because I guess the board of the, this, we are not involved in that, but the, this is the decision of the board of the Green Climate Fund, introduced some extra things. And, and in, in, in your case, if I'm a country and uh, thinking about result-based payment, uh, then of course it's, you would want to also consider who would provide these result-based payments? Because uh, even if I would say the decisions under the UNFCCC uh, have this uh, notion of stepwise and, and, and actually to accommodate national circumstances very much, then it's not necessarily uh, always the case to the same degree at least that this is true also for, for the financing entities. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, again, you can, uh, countries can, uh, basically when, when countries uh, decide what activities they have, uh, I think what is important is, uh, I mean, first actually we were thinking it's important not to include the same area under the two activities, but I, I think we see that sometimes, but I think really what is important is how you define your activities, because you want to be able to track your emissions and removal from the different activities so they don't count, you could say, more than one time. And that's in particular, of course, if you have separate frills. If you have one single frill, then it sort of uh, sums up and then maybe you don't have the same kind of problem. Uh, right now, for example, we have a submission from Bhutan. They have uh, selected uh, the activity conservation of forced carbon stock to happen in what they have uh, uh, sort of titled as conservation areas. And then they have other forest areas and this they have the uh, activity sustainable management of forests. So, so they track these two differently uh, and, and, and in the end they sort of sum it up and there's one single frail value. One uh, thing is of course, and maybe this is also behind this, the, when you think about blue carbon, is in case of Bhutan, let's say they have very positive results from conservation of forest carbon stocks but they don't have very positive results for the sustainable management of forest. In this case, of course, that could be the unfortunate situation that uh, it's not really uh, sort of the sum is not providing a, a result, uh, well, not a very good result. And, but then again, this was also at the time of negotiations, one of the ideas of moving to the national to ensure that, because what if there is some kind of displacement, maybe some activities from the conservation, has moved to the other one. And so, I mean, now I'm just speculating, uh, but this is one of the reasons for having uh, one value for the, for the whole country. Uh, Peter, uh, before you move to the next slide, yes. I just want to give a bit of context of this previous two slides that you've been very nicely discussing and offering very useful examples. Um, the situation in the region comes with countries having the mangroves already reported within their red plus frails. And then the question is, what would have to happen if they wanted to have their self-standing blue carbon um, out of this uh, frail and creating um, this, this one frail within red? Always, mm. I think it is very clear mm. that it has to be, it can be a separated 
uh, FRL or FREL, but it has to be within the red plus admission. So basically, the first slides were just showing that even though countries have now their FRELs uh, submitted, uh, they still can reconsider whether the promotion of blue carbon is worth the effort of, of that's what we will see in the next steps. What would be the, then the, the step forwards to move uh, the mangroves and the selected activities out of their current uh, front submission? So basically these first slides are just to show that even though some countries have aggregated uh, mitigation commitments on the red with all forest types and even all the red plus activities, this is not the only way that this could go forward. That there are other examples and countries have freedom to, to choose. And uh, uh, considering everything that you mentioned, right? That there is consistency in the definitions, consistency in the areas, and that is submitted within one monitoring system and so on. But basically, these first slides were just to show uh, the possibility or different possibilities that other countries are also uh, thinking about. Yeah, thank you so much, Peter. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this, uh, I think this, the question here was also related to uh, the greenhouse gas inventories. And of course, here uh, for developing countries, the situation is that uh, I think you are still able to use the uh, 1996 um, update, uh, but many countries have started to use the 2006 guidelines where you have a totally, uh, well, a, a different structure. This is also the structure that will be used in the future, but the future is still with the enhanced transparency framework for the Paris Agreement is still a few years. I mean, I think the, you need to start to report there uh, by 2024. But under there, you would have these different uh, land use categories and, and on the LULUCEF, and, and here you have forest. And uh, what we see uh, here now, are more referring to what we see in some, for some developed countries, is that they have different roles simply for different forest types because this would this makes sense for them because maybe the emission factors, maybe the, I mean, a big country like Canada, for example, would have the different regions, one row for that. And, and of course, this is also possible uh, in the case that you want a separate row for, for the mangroves. And there you would clearly be able to show also um, what is the sort of emissions removals from, from, from that. Uh, I wouldn't call it category because so for, for that row or whatever, I mean, for, for that forest type, so I, um, you would be able to see that uh, if you do it like that. Um, what we see for the for the frill, uh, so um, here we there, there is a, I mean basically all, always in the technical assessment we look if there is I mean especially for the when the results come whether it is um, consistent with the national greenhouse gas inventories. What we see uh, for the frills is that many cases actually countries have last time they made. A, a submission with a greenhouse gas inventory was maybe a, a, a national communication several years back. So in this case, data very often have improved considerably and, and therefore there's not so much consistency, but, but actually this is not an issue. This is just something that will be checked. But for the future, as countries would start to uh, report more, then there will be more and more uh, sort of aligned consistency between the two. Hopefully. Of course, if you have different activities and there are some activities you leave out or pools you leave out of your frill, but you still have in your greenhouse gas inventory, then there will be some differences. And, and in case, for example, a country only have part of their forest, then there will also be uh, some differences. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think this may be, and, and so that's, so what uh, for the blue carbon, what I understood was that the two activities that maybe are more relevant, uh, conservation and enhancement of forest carbon stocks, where they later could mean basically restoration of, of mangroves. Um, yeah, this is, this is possible. Again, the five activities you have from the Cancun agreements, uh, red plus activities, were never really defined uh, while, of course, reducing emissions from deforestation, yeah, then there are some deforestations, but in particular, uh, sustainable management of forest, enhancement of forest carbon stock, and, uh, and um, conservation of forest carbon stock, where I think there, there could be different 
interpretation by different countries on how, how they define these activities. And this is not a problem. The only problem is to be clear about it and, uh, and be able to uh, report based on that, how you define it. This is, the, this is sort of the, the important thing. Um, Yeah. Yes, the, the target of this slide, Peter, was uh, to answer some of the questions by the governments because um, they, they are keen to focus on conservation and restoration action for mangroves instead of focusing on, on um, degradation or deforestation uh, for different reasons. Uh, I think now it is very clear that uh, they should not omit deforestation and degradation if they are key emission sources. So. Uh, they can have also the sinks, but if those two are important, they should also include them. And then what we do in the next slides is to offer a few uh, scenarios of what is the starting point of some countries and what would happen if they wanted to choose conservation and uh, enhancement of forest carbon stocks restoration uh, for, for self-standing blue carbon uh, red plus friends. Mm. So basically, we will show a few scenarios of countries that, like for instance, in this case is Brazil, that doesn't have uh, any of these two sink activities, but they also, they don't have mangroves included in their current threats. So this would be a starting point that would be very different if they want to produce their blue carbon threats than countries maybe like Panama, that their starting point would be uh, all mm. the red plus mm. activities and all the forest types uh, within. So we will just show a few scenarios and a few ideas, as we always say, this is not prescriptive, yeah. it's just yeah. a few ideas of what countries could start considering for, for moving forwards towards this self-standing blue carbon within the red plus emission. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so yeah. Mm. So yeah, here yeah, I guess the, we mentioned Suriname has a fell for all forest types for deforestation and forest degradation. So this also includes the mangroves and includes all the rest of the, of the forest. If uh, the idea here that Suriname also wants to include a, a fell for the other two activities, uh, conservation and enhancement of forest carbon stock for the mangroves, in this case, uh, yeah, they would submit a new fell uh, and I would say they would not only, um, well, they, they, well, let's see, I mean, they have to be able to clearly define the new activities and the areas they are included for. And, and uh, I would say it would make sense to, yeah, let's, as long as you can define what you are doing and it's very clear, it can be quite complicated in, in a way it would be, maybe easier to have a separate frill then for the mangroves and a separate for the rest of the forest, but I'm not sure this is necessary in all cases. Uh, I guess if you can define your activities very much what you are doing, and then you can have these additional activities only for mangroves. But then of course, if one of the ideas and, uh, is that you want uh, separate results uh, for, for the mangroves, and you have still all your forest uh, in there. It, yeah, it's also about whether, I mean, whether you do this about adding up the different fells or whether you actually present them as separate fells. This is also one thing to consider. I think uh, also let me jump in for a very important um, question, I think. Um, in the case of uh, enhancement of forest carbon stock, which would be an increase of carbon stocks, uh, some of the areas that currently are reported under FREL for degradation would overlap with some of these uh, um, enhancement of forest carbon stocks, right? So in this case, where there is a clear overlapping, uh, either by creating a definition of enhancement of forest carbon stocks that ex omits the area mm. of, of degradation, or if you still want to incorporate the area that is degraded within the enhancement of forest carbon stocks, then I think then you would have to re-estimate and resubmit your original threats, right? It, and again, this is not prescriptive. This is, we, yeah. you are not an entity to offer methodologies. Yeah. It's just a bit of a nightmare yeah. of what are the complications, yeah? Thank you, Peter. Yeah, yeah I think you're, you're right that, I mean, in case you are in basically restoring the, mangroves and this is also counting towards uh, in a separate frill to the degradation then you can say you have one activities that 
and you remove for every ton of, uh, of CO2 you are removing, then it's somehow counting towards uh, results in two different fields. I think definitely there will be some, uh, some issue on, on that. So you have to show that this is not happening. And, and one easy way, of course, is to avoid to not have the overlapping of the areas. And, and another way would maybe we'll have to add the two together and uh, yeah. Yeah, great, Peter. That's that's great. Also, this also differs with Berra. I think Amy was mentioning that in the case of, of the voluntary carbon, you can have both um, sequestration and avoid it. Um, if I understood correctly, I will let uh, Amy answer that yeah. question at the end. Thank you, Peter. Um, and again, what is the difference between? Yeah, I think this is more or less uh, the same. To and, and mean. Surina made the submission, I think, two years ago, and uh, and of course they are always welcome to make a new one, and and then when they do make a new one, that's if I mean, and they will do something like here, uh, create a, a frill for mangroves for the for all activities and another frill, uh, FREL for the rest of the forest, for example. Yeah, one thing when they make the next submission, of course, is that is part of the decisions. Also, you have to explain what is the difference between. The, the previous one, and uh, yeah, there's uh, I, I mean, there's nothing that prevented, uh, but but you have to always be clear about what you are doing. Sorry, uh, Peter, uh, for this scenario to be, th this is actually quite an interesting case example because they would have mangroves within all forest types in the first sub mm. submission. And if it's emissions, they could leave it there together with all the forest types and then create one specific for mangroves for the seams, right? So for conservation and enhancement forest carbon stocks. But then they would have their blue carbon separated and merge with other forest types for the emissions while specifically for mangroves for the, for the, uh, uh, for the seam. So, uh, the other option would be that they also take out the emissions of the mangroves as a separated frill, F-R-E-L, for the mangroves. So, again, we are, we are just showing how complicated mm. this can be. Yeah, right? they, they are quite complicated and, and, and I think really you need to sit down and, and sort of consider how, how this can work and how you are not sort of... Um, I mean, counting the same ton of carbon towards uh, different uh, frills at the same time, uh, because obviously this, I think, would not work. Yeah, perfect, Peter, thanks very much, yep. Yeah, and here we have uh, another one. So this may be for Panama. So Panama uh, was uh, actually selected all five activities and all the forest types, as far as I remember, and um, yeah, and if they want to, since they already have all activities, they can hardly, well, they, they cannot add any activities. So if they want to do something different, split it up, I think it would consider sort of a step backwards because it's sort of going against the direction that, uh, that sort of the decisions are, are pointing towards that we should include all and all, all significant activities. Uh, but of course, if a country would make the submission, I mean, there's no, nothing in the decision saying you cannot do it. And uh, the, there will be a technical assessment and they will of course uh, also uh, ask this and they will say for, maybe they will say as for future improvement, maybe it's better to have uh, go to the national and have all the activities. And, and so, so Panama will be in a bit uh, funny situation if they would go against that, uh, yeah, I think that's all I, all I can, can say, uh, say for this. But I mean, there's not, we don't have decisions that say this is not possible. Yes, perfect, Peter, thanks. Mm -hmm. And okay, and now this is, um, well, I think what I was trying to say before, that uh, we are not, uh, as a secretariat, providing any result-based payments. And again, uh, of course, then there's the volunteer, but this is a whole different ball game, I would say. But what we have right now is at least we have this uh, Green Climate Fund, which is a pilot only. And of course the pilot will, I guess they will have to take some decisions about to continue that or to change that or what they will do and, and 
I would not be able to answer any questions on how uh, or what this will result in. Uh, but I know they have a scorecard, and I know they will, in some cases, they, this scorecard, they have what they call uh, pass and fail in some cases, and they have, in some cases, they have where they give you one or two or three, I think, depending on, on how well it, it fits to what the, the scorecard uh, is looking for. And, and then, basically, in the end, they provide the result-based payments, not only are based on the tons of emission reduction or removals, but also based on the result of the scorecard. And, and, and this is, of course, also important to look at if, if, uh, if this is what the party is, is looking for. Um, Uh, Peter, I think you can go to the, we've discussed these ones, yeah. maybe you can go to the, to the ones on NDCs and okay, yeah. ones. Thank yeah, you so okay. much. NDCs, okay, yeah. So, um, basically, uh, NDCs are, as the title, National Determined Contributions, Nationally Determined, and countries can uh, actually do, I mean, there's a lot of uh, freedom, uh, what parties have agreed is that for every new NDCs uh, that are submitted, it should be more ambitious than the previous. Uh, so this is one point to remember. Uh, another point is to remember that uh, based on the decisions taken uh, in Katowice, there was a decision uh, for uh, CMA1 where they, there's an annex providing information that parties uh, should provide to what they call facilitate clarity, transparency, on, and understanding of the NDC. Um, so here's a, and, and one of the elements, for example, is uh, countries or parties should uh, select indicators for the, for the, the national determined contribution to sort of be able to track the progress towards meeting the, the uh, uh, NDC. Uh, but for sure, uh, Parties can include red plus. They can include, uh, yeah. There's, there's. I would say, you can, yeah, a lot. Uh, there's a lot of freedom here. Uh, Peter, let me jump in because I think one of the questions. I think this is very important. We've heard a lot from the governments in the region that uh, red plus and incorporating red plus in NDCs might not be allowed. So we are here saying that from a reporting perspective. Uh, there is no problem in incorporating the red plus. There, there, there is no, no problem. Maybe, and maybe we come to that another slide. Um, because you can put in the NDCs and you will, uh, for the red plus, but then there's also this issue of uh, double counting. And of course, uh, let's say uh, a country re reduce the emissions by a million ton and somehow, now we don't know how this, there's a, a ongoing negotiations under what is called uh, Article 6, where there's three different uh, sort of agenda items. I will have a slide on that. Uh, and let's say uh, Germany, for example, will buy all these uh, emissions reduction from a country to, because Germany, and, and the rules are so this is possible, but there's, there's a lot of assumptions here. So then Germany will use it to meet their NDC. And then of course, if the country have already included in their own NDC, then uh, that they would also, then there could be some issue. The problem is for me right now is that it's really very, very difficult to give any advice here because we don't have the rules uh, for how this will work. And, uh, but, but for sure, when they mention double counting, then they, uh, as at a minimum, are thinking about it should not count towards meeting NDCs in two different countries at the same time. Um, so this could be one issue. But then, of course, there's also other considerations. And again, this is part of this negotiations. I don't know where it's going to go, but is that maybe a, a country or party cannot, uh, you could say, uh, sell any emission reduction unless they have this activity also in the NDC. So it's, um, yeah, it's very poor advice I give here because I'm just saying there's a lot of uncertainty and I'm not able to answer that. Uh, because we, we really don't know yet. Uh, Peter, but this is extremely important because that was also one of the confusions that we saw in the in the work um, mm -hmm. in the regional work 
workshop last year. So this last point that you touch on, if the NDCs do not cover the activities, then funding could not be included. And in the case, and as you said, this is not decided, yeah? So no one really knows what would be the regulation. But I think one of the problems also of incorporating red plus into NDCs is the, the situation of receiving funding from NDC international support and then receiving funding for performance-based of their forest mitigation action. So, and, I, and again, this could be some issues that might be able to be solved when the Article 6 negotiations move forward. But my point here is then technically, from a reporting point of view, they can be included, red plus targets can be included in NDCs. That seems something that it's aligned with what you were saying, but then there are all these caveats, right? So, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, right now, for example, we know that for this is for the pilot of the red plus result-based payment, and, and, and that will maybe look different when we are past 2020, well, we are in 2020 now, but the results they are paying for right now is more from 14, 15, 16, I think. Um, there, I think the Green Climate Fund made it clear that they will not claim the emission reductions, but this the country can use that to meet their own whatever uh, target. But of course, this would be a target for before 2020. So it's not really so relevant for the indices that countries maybe want to make now. Um, and, and this is for the... Uh, for the Green Climate Fund, I, I, I assume it could be quite different if it was a country that would pay for the results unless, uh, yeah, I don't know, to be honest, how it, how it will work. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. And of course, when we talk about red plus into NDCs, we talk about blue carbon into NDCs as well. So it's yeah, the same yeah. discussion, yeah? yeah? Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, yeah, so this is actually, yeah, this is about the, uh, first of all, the uh, Article 6. Uh, so here, actually, we have uh, these three ones. We have uh, 6.2, Article 6.2, with for uh, cooperative approaches. Again, since there's no agreement on any of these, then it's very difficult to characterize them. But maybe 6.2 is more between countries. But I'm not sure there's even agreement about that. Then 6.4, uh, it's called mechanism. Some would say this is sort of the new CDM, but different, I'm sure. Uh, but this is a kind of more project type of base. But again, this is not. And then finally, there's some 168 non market uh, based approaches. Um, of course, one of the big things that have been discussed, and as you might remember, there was supposed to be an agreement about this in Katowice at COP26. Now we are going to next time next year to COP. No, 24, sorry. Uh, but now next time we go to 26, so also in Madrid at COP25, parties were not able to agree. So this very difficult uh, negotiations. And here I just mentioned some of the issues. Of course, how to track and avoid double counting. This is, was a big issue. Uh, they use a term called corresponding adjustments. Uh, this, uh, I don't think there's really too much. There's, this uh, is discussed a lot. They have discussion about how to account that countries have different NDCs. I mean, some will have an NDC that is, a, you could say, a point target where this we will reduce emissions by, by 15% by 2030, and others will have an, an, a target for every year to watch uh, 2030. How to compare these kind of things if you start to transfer the the the. For the 6.2, at least, they, they have this title, International Transferable Mitigation Outcomes, ITTMOs. Here, they also discuss who can use these. There's different uh, views on that as well. Uh, of course, there's also, and there was, uh, what kind of activities can be included. Here, again, there was uh, also, yeah, I mean, there was different interpretations, I think, and uh, or, or views, not interpretations. There was different views on, what to do with sort of existing credits from older activities. This could be like from the CDM uh, or, or joint implementation under the Kyoto Protocol. What, how will they be able to be used in the future, if at all, or is there a limitation to that? That was a very difficult question. Uh, then there are the other issues that, of course, whatever you do uh, should be real, additional, measurable. Permanence is an issue. 
governance, I think this is more, very much related to the mechanism, for example. Share of proceeds, this is also a discussion. I mean, you maybe you know that for the CDN, there's a share of proceeds that go to the adaptation fund. There's a similar issue discussed here, and, and what should the size be? And yeah, there are so many elements. And, and in Katowice, the presidency engaged uh, in the final days on this, and still we had no outcome. In Madrid, it was the same issue, and of course, we all hope there will be clarity at the next COP, uh, but it is a very difficult uh, um, topic, and um, yeah, and, and that's simply just the situation, and, and therefore, it's diff impossible for me to say that it's most likely going to end like that or that, because really, I don't know, and I don't think anyone would. Uh, want to guess, well, maybe someone, but I think as a secretary, at least we should not guess on that because we don't know. Absolutely, Peter. I think all these issues of um, double counting and payments and, and then how to do or to track for this voluntary market with UNFCCC and it's still, as you are very clearly mentioned here, not yet defined. Countries need to agree on that, so it is yet unclear how that will go. Uh, Peter, I cannot thank you enough for this wonderful presentation. I think you really clarified a lot of doubts. If you, if you had some more patience for 10 minutes questions, that would be fabulous. We've opened the floor to the governments in the region. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah? Great. Um, Isabel, would you kindly open the chat for final questions? Thank you again, Peter. So maybe I don't need, I stop share the screen maybe. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay, let's start. Let's start with Colombia. So they mentioned that in their definition of natural forests, they include trees over five meter height, 30% uh, of crown canopy, uh, and that includes only partially the mangroves. And this is the same situation in, Ma in Mexico mm. with their dwarf mangroves. So he says, um, we want to include other mangroves as coastal wetlands in our inventories of carbon but also make a zoom on the contribution of mangroves defined as natural forests under soils. How do you suggest dealing with this? This is the first question. Yeah, I, I think it depends uh, what you mean to make a zoom, because if you remember the example from Bhutan, so they, uh, how they will report, they will both report on these protected areas where they have uh, conservation and they will report on the other forest. And I think actually they also have the, well, I know they also have the, enhancement of forest carbon stock, they will be, all of this will be in there also when they report res, results. In the end, of course, they will add the different numbers and there will only be one result, well, in two results because of, they have one for removals and one for emissions. Uh, but, but all the uh, removals will be in, in one only, uh, but sort of you could say in the report, it will still be very clear how much is coming from the different uh, forest types and, and from the different activities. So it depends, do you want to have it reflected, like you could say, this is our results from here, and, and this, or, or you want to, I mean, in the technical assess, uh, analysis of, of results from Bhutan, when hopefully they will have some results in the future, the technical assessment will focus on all the different activities and the different force types. So, so it will be clear for Bhutan and for anyone that reads the report, how much is from the different, uh, activities and, and these different force types. Yes, so, so basically, Peter, if they wanted to have a specific definition for, for mangroves, they, they are allowed to have a specific definition of mangroves with different thresholds than they are using for other forest types, right? So there is no, if they specify that they need a different definition for mangroves, would, the, the, would you see a problem there? I mean, the, if the definition also fits, I mean, with all of, I mean, the, the, the cases we have had basically has been that the definitions did not fit very well with mangroves because basically the mangroves were not tall enough to sort of meet the, the tres height threshold. And, and therefore, countries said, we, we, for these mangroves, we made an exception to the threshold exactly. because we want to include them. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think this answers the question. Um, then it's from Suriname. Uh, Suriname is asking if they understood correctly, Suriname could report on blue carbon under the red plus activities of conservation and enhancement in separate FRELs or FRLs, uh, but should exclude mangrove from previous FREL reporting? That's the first question. 
Let me ask you the question again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, Suriname has all forest types for deforestation and for degradation mm, yeah, relating yeah. to logging. And then they're asking if they want to report on conservation and enhancement of uh, forest carbon stock in a separate frail, they should exclude it from the current frail reporting. I think if, if the new activity, uh, again, this is you have to think, if the new activities they want to do uh, are contributing to results both, I mean, if they want to have two different fuels and it's contributing to results in two different fuels, then there's a problem with including the area in both, I would say. In this case, uh, I would not want to have the area, um, but uh, yeah. I don't know if that, and that of course you means you need to change your, your previous uh, fuel submission as well. Yes, I, I, and the question also, I, I think uh, Suriname, uh, Consuela, the, the topic here is that for conservation or for their enhancement of forest carbon stock, it may overlap other areas that you are currently reporting as mangrove degradation, right? So the areas mm. that you are reporting as degradation, they may improve carbon and therefore they also would be into the red plus activity of enhancement of forest carbon stocks and therefore there you have a problem if you want to have a blue carbon that is focusing only on the sinks because it's overlapping areas so one mm. possible possible there may be other ways way of doing this is if you want to have like only like the sink contribution uh, for the areas that overlap you should decide either you leave it under degradation or you leave it under the enhancement of forest carbon mm. stock and if you, if you decide to move the area degraded towards this new activity, then yes, you have to reestimate and resubmit your frail. But if you decide to use an area of sink that you don't overlap with your current submission, then you leave the current submission as it is, and you create then a frail FRL positive uh, for the activities that you are uh, willing to work on that just doesn't overlay with the current submission. Yeah. So basically, yeah. this is one option, right, Peter? Yeah, but, uh, but I would assume that for the new, I mean, the, the uh, LULUCEF experts that make the technical assessment would probably still have this uh, uh, yeah. identified for future improvement that actually there would be one single fuel for the country in, instead of having a number of fuels because this number of fuels, there's always this risk of displacement and, and things that become makes it more complicated comparing to if you have everything under one. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, creating a self-standing blue carbon it would be necessary if you are aiming for uh, payments for results exclusive, exclusively for, for mangroves, but it does complicate a lot mm. uh, the, the reporting and, and, uh, and the monitoring and so on. Um, then we have another question. Um, from Peru. It says, is it possible for a government regarding its NDCs to demonstrate additionality by just protecting mangroves, uh, for example, by showing forecasts for substantially, uh, uh, by showing that without a policy for protection, these mangroves would be degraded? So I guess the question goes, can you only have um, conservation of mangroves as one activity within the NDCs um, by showing uh, additionality? Yeah, I mean, now I understand the question so that this is not necessarily following red plus, but this is sort of uh, outside red plus. And, and in this case, uh, I guess what you do in your NDCs is, um, yeah, the, I mean, if you are following the, the red plus, then you will have a reference level and then your, your additionality, you could say we don't really use that term, but then you will basically have results compared to the reference level. And, and this is, I guess, if you compare it to uh, voluntary carbon market, what we would then say, this is the additionality that is beyond, but, but we just don't use that term. Um, but if it's outside the red plus, I, I don't know, I guess you, you would have to select some indicator uh, and uh, yeah, then, it's not really governed by the UN uh, the Red Plus decisions. Um, I don't know these indicators what they could be in this case, but maybe there's this is something that party have some idea that uh, yeah, I, really this is quite uh, hypothetically question. <laughs> That's a little bit difficult to answer. Yes, I agree. I, I think it's not exactly clear uh, what he was mentioning. Um, then yeah, again. 
the, the topic of additionality appears a lot, and I think you were mentioning that this concept doesn't really exist under the UNFCCC because we have a, a question from TNC saying, uh, for NDCs, do you need to demonstrate additionality like CDM or voluntary carbon projects? And I think this has to no. also, yeah, maybe you can explain no, that. You're, you have your, your uh, reference level, basically, and in, in the majority of cases, the reference level is the sort of the average of historic emissions over a period before, and, and then the country make the kind of assumption that, you know, this is uh, what will continue. Uh, in the future, and uh, if we do whatever we do better than this, then uh, we have uh, some results. And this is basically just mentioned measured in tons of carbon per year. Uh, of course, these results could also be because, let's say, uh, the soy prices went really down, and normally it was because of the conversion into soya production that we had the deforestation. And and this is not. I mean, we don't have. I think for voluntary carbon mining, you have very much to link it to. Uh, specific interventions like here we do uh, uh, a, a management plan and we we yeah we manage the force in a particular way and we can more or less unless something goes wrong foresee what the results will be uh, of course for red plus you also have a national strategy and you do different activities but in the end you have many factors that impact your force and some of them could be positive but some of them unfortunately are sometimes also negative and um, and and I think there's much more sort of uh, linking uh, results to specific intervention in the voluntary carbon market compared to if you have this reference level for the whole country, for example. Yes, yes, thank you, Peter. And then um, we have a last question. Uh, this has already been answered, but uh, maybe you could remind us. Um, uh, well, another from Serena, I'm sorry. Are there examples where countries include blue carbon in their greenhouse gas inventories uh, for national communication under AFOLU? And um, we, we know the answer to that. Uh, if I understood it clearly, the answer was yes, it can be included as a category on the forest land uh, in the greenhouse gas inventory for national communications under AFOLU. Yeah, well, first I would clarify that it is, of course, under the IPCC, we have this uh, AFOLU chapter. Uh, but how, it, at least uh, in the greenhouse gas inventories, the, the parties have uh, agreed that we report LULUSEF in one sector, no, sorry, we report yeah, LULUSEF in one sector and we report agriculture in one sector. So that's sometimes a little bit confusing when we mention AFOLU here. Under the LULUSEF, yeah, then we have these six land use categories, forest land, cropland, grassland, wetlands, uh, uh, settlements, and other lands, and then again, sub categories and so on for forest land converted to cropland, et cetera, et cetera. But when you report here, yeah, then, um, for example, there's a, we can say a, a table where you would normally report what we call forest land, remaining forest land. And uh, here we would, you could then have a row saying that, uh, okay, this is our pine forest. Another row, well, maybe not. Well, let me say uh, for, Canada would have maybe one, this is British Columbia, this is Alberta, this is, I mean, some, I mean, there's different ways how you can do it, but it will basically just enhance transparency instead of uh, saying that everything is, is under one, because the calculations you will have to do behind in order to, to sort of complete uh, the numbers for this greenhouse gas inventory would probably anyway uh, include some Excel spreadsheets with a sort of the contribution from the different force type and and you might as well put more of that information in the greenhouse gas inventory itself because this will basically just enhance transparency. Uh, yes, Peter, let me, let me actually um, maybe follow up on that question. Consuela, uh, in, in the current moment, the only country that is reporting blue carbon within their greenhouse gas inventories is uh, Australia. And we will have Australia in the next session to explain us what were their lessons learned from incorporating their, their not only mangroves, they also have uh, seagrass, uh, so in a country like, like Suriname, as, as Peter was saying, within the reporting LULUCF, if you choose your mangroves to be forests, then under the section of forests, you create a subcategory that would be mangroves, and there you report the mangrove emissions, either in forest land, remaining forest land, or in other land uses that um, become forests. Uh, so there are all these three possibilities, right? I think for, for non-annex one countries, it's, it's 
a bit difficult to visualize these common reporting mm. format tables because they are not requested to report on that. Mm. But basically, Consuela, uh, either if you define them as wetlands, you would incorporate them as wetlands. If you define them as forests, you would put them on forests. And then you would choose whether it's forests that remain forests, so conservation or enhancement of forest carbon stocks activities would be within this forest land remaining forest land or wetland remaining wetland if you have defined your, your mangroves as wetlands. And then the other uh, reporting tables, which would be forests that go into the other um, uh, categories through deforestation. Then if you have the forestation of mangroves, you could also create a specific line for mangroves that are deforested and then incorporate their greenhouse gas emissions. So the answer is yes, you can and you should if you want to have a self-standing blue carbon within your greenhouse gas inventories, separate and track. And that's what Peter was saying. The most important thing is that you track in a consistent manner. Uh, and also that if you now separated and before you didn't, you make sure that then there is consistency in the time series so that you don't start uh, adding changes in areas or changes that would make the time series not consistent. And if there are changes that are important, then you also need to resubmit your early emissions so the entire time series is consistent. But the answer is yes, mm -hmm. right? Peter, is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I think the last very question, and we close and thank you kindly for this. Um, as I said, this is something already asked uh, about. Uh, here she is. Um, Elisa is asking if there is any kind of regulation for countries that have included blue carbon into their NDCs or their frets uh, on how to deal with voluntary markets and their double counting. I think you, you mentioned that already very clearly with the Article 6, but maybe you could elaborate. Uh, yeah, this is, this is a, a complicated because, I mean, based on the history with the Kyoto Protocol, at least, there was not really, I mean, what happened on the Kyoto Protocol, there's no recognition of, of what is happening in voluntary carbon markets. So, in, in fact, you could have a double counting there because basically parties did not really care about that. Of course, now, I think with the Paris Agreement, it becomes more complicated because all parties actually will have an NDC um, and, and therefore, there will be some contribution from all parties. Again, the role of the voluntary carbon market, again, could be, uh, uh, I mean, depending if, if under, for example, uh, the uh, Article 6.4, uh, what kind of activities would be voluntary, maybe parties would agree that this particular kind of activities uh, uh, that have these standards from this voluntary carbon standards will be accepted under the Paris Agreement, then it's a, kind of different situation again, but of course we don't know that yet. And um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's a bit uncertain. Thank you, Peter. I think we have to thank you warmly and kindly because it's very late for you there in Germany and uh, you came from a very busy day. So thanks so much for your participation. I personally really enjoy uh, the examples and the, the situations of different countries that could illustrate potential pathways for, for Latin America and the Caribbean. So thank you warmly. Um, we're going to close the session now. And the only thing is um, we will send you uh, emails with the presentation so that you can uh, read them more quietly and kind of digest the very large amount of information that is being given here. Uh, just as a warning, as you can see, there is this now new trend of talking about blue carbons and NDCs, mm -hmm. and uh, we all love it. I think I think saving our mangroves is what we all have in our in our heads, right? We do need to protect coastal forests, which right now are absolutely abandoned. But the complexities of doing that are also large. So they're not impossible, but countries need to have a very clear vision of why they are doing it and uh, what are the benefits of doing it within the UNFCCC versus VERA. But, and, 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 and what are the national policies uh, and targets without any um, considerations of the UNFCCC on the barrel market. So what is the ecosystem protection that countries want to offer these um, this, this coastal forests uh, without, with, without necessarily thinking on, on, on the frameworks of climate change, uh, but also in the framework of UNFCDD or, or the other, other type of international Ramsar agreements and so on. So there is not only one framework within mangroves are important, it's also important important to think that countries do have to have their own policies and their own regulations. 
Um, so we will share the slides with links and then we will let you know when the second session of this webinar comes at uh, real, which would be the week on the 20th of July. We will have the government of Australia explaining us their lessons learned from having the self-standing reporting of, of blue carbon within their national greenhouse gas communications. Yeah? Uh, and then we would have someone from the Green Climate Fund and the uh, Global Environmental Fund to talk about un unlocking uh, sources of finance for blue carbon. And then Suriname government, very kindly also, uh, actually Guyana, sorry, very kindly uh, will share some experiences of their submissions of, of mangrove related uh, projects to in, in these two uh, financing bodies. So thanks very much to all the um, speakers, particularly Peter, very late there in Germany, and Amy, thanks so much. And uh, we will be in touch with all of you. Thanks very much for participating. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Peter.